Lewis and I are joined today by Andy Vassily, host of the Run Your Life podcast. This is a double pod, meaning the episode will be available to listeners of both our podcasts. Today we'll be talking about fear, and the singer-songwriter Jewel describes fear as the thief that robs you of the only opportunity you have to create change. Now, Andy, you used those words in a recent piece of writing you shared on social media. So please tell us about why fear is a topic you're exploring right now. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Uh, and and Lewis, it's great to connect with you both. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come together. Um, fear for me has uh, been a topic of exploration for many years. Uh, I guess, you know, if I do an early flyover of uh, childhood, uh, you know, growing up in a family uh, that was very dysfunctional, there was mental health issues, addiction issues, um, that led to a lot of years of trying to uh, understand the impact that that had on my life growing up. And without question, uh, fear was the, the concept that always kind of uh, rose to the top uh, that I, I needed to double click on and unpack further. So the more I got into my work with mental health and well-being, the more prevalent the concept of fear was. So then I started to do a lot of research around the concept of fear, imposter syndrome, all of these different things. And, and I think to this day, it still drives me in, in the work that I do, and I'm constantly trying to better understand it. So that's kind of a snippet into uh, why it's such an important theme for me to uh, explore and unpack. Um, and I think it's, it's probably prudent at this stage to, to define fear in terms of what we believe as a, as a three we're talking about today. Um, fear is the emotion caused by real and imminent threat of danger, pain or harm. And often there's a physiological as well as a psychological response to that. Um, and with that in mind, I think the topic that I'd like to introduce or, or for us to, to have a conversation around first is the idea of fear being a, a sort of innate characteristic that we have as humans. Um, and, and this is something I've been hugely interested in for, for many, many years. And, and I'll sort of get to the personal reasons why um, in a little bit as, as, as we talk through this. But I think from a, an evolution and an ancestry point of view, as mammals, you know, we, we, we've been walking the earth for hundreds of thousands of years and and we've not always been top of the food chain. We've not always been the people um, and the species that we are now. And that's really, really interested me. Our place as mammals has often been vulnerable, and it's been vulnerable, I believe, for, 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 for two, two biological reasons. One is our, uh, is our an, a, an annoying habit that we have of having to have so much sleep every day. Um, we're incredibly vulnerable when we sleep in, and if we need to sleep for eight hours a day in one long spell, which seems to be the, the modern way in which we sleep, that makes us very vulnerable. Um, certainly a little bit less now than it did many thousands of years ago. Um, and also from a, a female biology point of view, we have a, a long gestation period for our, for our young, and then our young are very vulnerable for a prolonged period of time in comparison to lots of other mammals. Um, and, you know, reading the work of, of Harari and Sapiens and, and Sapolsky, Robert Sapolsky, who has written two fabulous books, um, one called Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which is a wonderful observation. Um, and the other one being, I think it's called Behave, which is a, a book all about human behavior. Um, and he goes into a, a lot of depth into these areas. And, and, and the reason why this started to be something that I looked at was through my own personal journey of sort of anxiety and pain and the fear that, that arose because of anxiety and pain. Um, and like many people, I was Googling online for, for answers to this. You know, why, why does anxiety exist? Why do I have anxiety? I think it's probably prudent at this stage to point out the, the real close relationship that anxiety has with fear. Um, and the only real thing that I can find that sort of separates the two, and, and do correct me if you guys have signed, found anything else, is essentially fear is real and there is imminent pain or imminent danger that's going to happen, whereas anxiety is your brain perceiving that that's going to happen and then you responding to those emotions that happen as a result. 
So they're inextricably linked, and, and we know that, that one might drive the other. So when it came to movement, um, I'd, I'd been Googling different ways of getting out of pain. I'd been experiencing back pain, and this was even in my 20s, you know, young. Um, I know 80% of America have back pain now, but the reasons why for that are varied, and, and they're also quite mysterious. You know, we're, we're quite a robust species that's meant to be bipedal. You know, we, we walk on two feet and we wander the land, and we've done that for, for hundreds of thousands of years. So why do we have back pain? And why was I specifically having back pain? And why was I so anxious in different scenarios? So like many people, I went through a series of sort of let me do this stretch, that stretch, or the other stretch before and after exercise. Um, I started to look at different chiropractic methods, different massage methods. And this all started to, to really um, begin to fuel this, this wonder and this real sort of desire to find out why is this the case? You know, what, why as mammals do we feel anxiety? Why am I in pain if I can't move particularly well? Or is it because I can't move particularly well that I'm in pain? And I'd be really interested to hear your, your guys' sort of thoughts on this, because I think from an evolutionary point of view, it does make sense that if we are vulnerable and we're injured or we're in pain, that we're going to be anxious because we have everything to be anxious about. If we can't move particularly well, our tribe might leave us behind. If we can't move particularly well, we're more likely to be hunted. If we can't move particularly well, we're more likely to be weak and to be picked off by, by people that are stronger than us. So which one causes which was sort of the first question I was going to ask. And I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. Is it that the anxiety is driven by the pain that you're in? Or could it be that the pain that you're in and the lack of mobility that you have creates the anxiety and then that affects the movement? Cool. Okay, I'll, I, just, I just want to jump in. Alan, you can add uh, your thoughts as well, but... I would be very interested in knowing, uh, I've done a lot of work uh, around uh, compassionate inquiry, which is inquiring into the impact of early childhood trauma on uh, adult life, the life we live. And Dr. Gabor Mate is world renowned. He's a Canadian psychologist. And what he says is that um, anxiety is, is a manifestation of early trauma. So the question he would ask if he just listened to you is how far back in your life does the feeling of anxiety go so that he can begin to unpack with the client, uh, with the person he's having a conversation with, uh, how far back it, it went so that they can learn to kind of sit with the emotion of it because what he says, it's the inability to express ourselves as young people that leads to not being seen, not being valued, not being heard, not mattering. And then we repress these, these feelings and emotions and we have nobody to share it with when we're young. So that leads to anxiety, which leads to physical manifestations of pain in the body in different ways, back pain, high blood pressure, joint pain, headaches, so I'm not saying that's the right answer. I, I would just throw back at you that, that question. So Lewis, if you were to kind of scan back, how far back does the feeling of anxiety go? And I think to answer that question, you need to be able to recognize anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not convinced that that's something that I could do um, as a child or in my adolescence. I certainly can now as an adult through all sorts of different reasons as, as to why in terms of becoming much more comfortable with who you are, understanding yourself better, and being more present in terms of awareness through mindfulness and meditation and all those kinds of things, which I'm sure we'll touch on as we go through this conversation. Um, but to try and pinpoint exactly when you started to feel anxious, I think it's a really, really difficult thing to do. But I like what you've said there around the, um, the idea of physical pain being a manifestation of anxiety. Um, and that idea that if you if you if you are holding things in and, and you are in a position where you're feeling anxious, that's going to come out in some way, shape, or form. And it reminds me of a of a book I read not long ago, which thousands of people have, um, from Dr. Sarno, which is the Healing Back Pain 
book. I don't know if you've heard of that. And Dr. Sana is a, a huge advocate for this idea of psychosomatic um, pain. And, and, and he's very much along the same lines as the theory that you just mentioned there, Andy, that if there's pain, it's because something is not quite right psychologically. Um, and that's not to say that um, that's in the makeup of your brain as such. That's more to say that it isn't a handling of the emotions in the correct manner. So actually stop and consider what emotion you're feeling and why that emotion might be manifesting itself in a different way. Now, <clears throat> going back to your question of can you identify where anxiety started? I can tell you where my physical pain started. Um, and I can tell you where different issues within my body started that I started to work out and to find different ways forward for as I went through, which might be a, a clue as to when that anxiety started. So I have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disease, which is, in Dr. Sano's words, a, a direct result of anxiety. Um, I also used to have really bad back pain, which I'm now working my way out of, and, and I'd love to talk about how I've been doing that. Um, and how absolutely revelationary that's been for my life, um, certainly in the past three or four years. Um, I don't know, Alan, if, if, if you've got any thoughts around that as well. I know that when, when you were playing professional football a few years back, you were under all sorts of pressure to have pain-killing injections and such to play. Um, where's that link for you between anxiety and, and physical pain? I'd like... <laughs> It's funny, I want, can, I, can I come back to the question later on about why don't zebras get ulcers? That's my, that's my massive thing here, because I yes. think this is all to do with Darwinism, so we'll come back to that later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly think, and I'm very much in agreement with, with what Andy says, a lot of this is going back deep, and I've been doing a lot of work recently studying the work of friends, uh, the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, and his concept of habitus. And if you don't mind, I'd like to just spend a bit of time going back to my journey and linking the concept of fear to imposter syndrome that you've touched upon already, Andy. In simple terms, habitus is where your views, habits, and life journey is completely shaped by your personal history. And your fears are shaped by your lived experiences. So what you've seen, what you've felt, what you've experienced, but also the fear of the unknown, which is a little bit where the acronym uh, of fear comes in, false emotions appearing real. Because when I look back at my childhood, I, I, I grew up in a, in a pretty rough, low socioeconomic deprived area of, of Sheffield in the north of England. My mum my cared for my dad who had multiple cirrhosis and was in a wheelchair for the vast majority of my childhood. We, we had little money. I went to the, the local school around the corner. I didn't really know any different. And my parents did the best they could with what we had. But from my perspective there, or linking it back into fear, for me growing up was basically survival. And we can link that into that zebra that we're talking about. It was Darwinism at its best. It was a fear was a constant emotion that you had to deal with. Now, I didn't have hugely traumatic events, but obviously my dad being in a wheelchair and not having a lot of money and living in a, a really tough place. It was the fear of it was that fear that just haunted me throughout my childhood. And I'll give you some examples of that. I, I lived in a catchment area of the rival school, not my own school because my dad needed access to a wheelchair apartment and we didn't have them in catchment. So I would live in the fear of getting beat up every day by the rival school as I'm traveling to my school. And I had to do two bus journeys to get to mine. Would, would the older, more powerful boys at school take my dinner money? Would I get called names for wearing rubbish clothes because we had no money? How could I get in with the popular crowd? The list could go on, but that was constant living in fear. And, and as Lewis touched upon, my football was an escape, but the fear actually bizarrely only got worse as I got better because the pressures of wanting and expecting to become a professional footballer were so huge. I became paralyzed with a fear of failure. And that just brings in that sort of next acronym for me of how my life shaped through fear is that 
failure expected and received. Yeah. If the expectations that people set for you on your estate are low and the school is poor, then that's what you achieve. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I felt that I went to a school where expectations were low, behavior was poor, zero learning. I lived on an estate where benefit culture was rife. If I was lucky enough to get a job, it'll be in the steelworks that Sheffield's famous for. There was no aspirations and we weren't shown what our possibilities were. It's, it's interesting there because at that point I was really lucky because I was involved in a professional football club, but I didn't believe in my ability enough to actually really make it. So I didn't. So that it ties together with that habitus that Bordeaux talks about. You are your experiences and where you're from, unless you can break that cycle. Yes, Andy. Yeah. I just wanted to add there. So I, I wrote a blog post yesterday, but um, that, uh, focused on the work of Dr. Dan McAdams. Uh, I think he's a Northwestern University psychologist, and he's done a boatload of research into a narrative identity, what you described there, uh, and what he calls uh, historians of self, that we are all historians of self based on our personal narratives, and that we make sense of our present life and future life based on our past life. And that's where you get into these self-fulfilling prophecy kind of loops and negative ways of thinking. And then you project it forward into the future saying, well, if it happened in the past, it's going to happen in the future. And then there's some level of acceptance. So mm -hmm. the, the highest performers in the world without question, like the, the, you know, when you consider the arrowhead being the most elite, right? The tip of the arrow are the ones who will look deeply at this stuff and do the deep internal work needed to address what you're saying, to not repeat the same stories in our head and to build the internal capacity and internal skill set to reshape our own narratives, to um, better address fear and perceive through uh, fear and, and real fear. So I just wanted to, to drop that in. So there's, there's so much research for the listeners out there around this idea of personal narrative and habitus, as, as you said, there's so much work out there uh, that's needed to be explored. And, and what, what you're starting to touch on there, I think, Andy, is the awareness of knowing that you're in that self-fulfilling prophecy and that, that continuous cycle of emotion, response, rejection, or emotion, response, failure. And to try and break that requires that awareness of understanding that what you're feeling is likely an anxiety and recognizing the emotions that you're feeling as a result of that anxiety and then recognizing that the anxiety is caused by something that isn't yet real. Once it becomes real, it becomes the fear. Um, and if I'm listening to Alan right, his sort of thoughts were, I'm from this estate, I've got no money, I'm from a working class family. I'm in a professional football club. I ain't got a chance of making this. I'm not like these other kids who've got dishwashers at home, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and, all this, and all this other posh stuff. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And I, I remember at 16, I did okay in my school for the, for the school that I was in. But then as I sort of progressed onto A-levels into a sixth form centre and I started meeting students from all over the city. It didn't broaden my horizons. It made my fear worse because I felt I wasn't good enough to belong. They had the nice clothes, I just, they had the cars, they had lived in nice houses, they got better GCSEs than me. I absolutely hated it. I, and I used the, there's a seminal moment where I was down at the army recruiting office in Sheffield town center. And I may have told this before, but I just felt like a way out. I needed a sense of belonging. I needed to go and maybe go and do something. And then I saw my old PE teacher in, in the city centre next to the recruiting office. So I, and he had a really good relationship with my old PE teacher. And I, I'd love to see if he's listening. Wayne Thomas is called. And he, I got into the recruitment centre and he goes, come here. Talk to him, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm going to sign up for Army, Wayne. And he goes, you have got so much potential you could become what I do. You, you could become a, PE ten, become a PE teacher. And really it was instilling someone had that belief. And 
that then sort of got me on that a turn, a little bit of a turn because someone believed in me. And then I thought about this acronym of fear of then for everything, a reason. Yeah. A seminal moment. And that, that started to, to shape my life then. And, and again, another seminal moment. I was at college. I didn't even apply for universities or anything like that. I didn't even know I could aspire to that. It never happened before. I didn't have any cash. I was going to afford it. And I remember a mate was driving to a, a university fair. This is pre-internet days, guys. You didn't have all the online prospectus. You had to go and physically go to a fair and pick up a big, massive wodge of prospectuses, read through and choose your course. And my mate said he's off. And I said, oh, I'll just go along. Didn't even know about it. Didn't even, like, totally blase. Just went along. And uh, it was at Sheffield Arena. I remember it now. And uh, it was pure slice of luck that I picked up my hometown's university prospectus and saw that they did a teaching degree in PE. And it was the only course I applied for. I didn't, I remember going to the interview. I didn't even have a shirt and tie. I didn't even possess a shirt and tie at that point. I just turned up in like a tracky or something. <laughs> and for some miracle, because for everything a reason, they accepted me. And it was then at university, I started to feel a sense of belonging and a calling in teaching but I was still plagued with self-doubt because to then I was mixing with more people from higher socio and economic backgrounds um, and then obviously you start your career as teaching and I started teaching in the same schools that that I went to myself I had a real affinity with those students who were growing up certainly like I did the the I know that the, often when you're listening to people, and if you read anything about listening, you're told to listen and to not compare and to, to not <laughs> and to not then talk about your story. But I didn't know that about you, about the army office. And I experienced yeah. almost exactly the same thing. Um, so for those people that don't know, Alan taught me when I was at secondary school. He was my PE teacher for my last year or so. Was it two years when I was in year 10 and 11? Yeah, maybe. two years. And we had a, a half assed effort in the school that I went to of guiding you in a career. I'm not sure it was career advice, but it was what job are you going to do? That was the, that was the question that you were asked. Um, and I did exactly the same thing Alan just talked about. I went to the army recruitment office in Sheffield. I got off the tram opposite the city hall. Um, and I nipped in the recruitment centre, but I was wanting to go into the RAF and not in the army. And it was at the time, if you remember, when the world, oh, not the world at all, but the, the Great Britain had, had uh, started to have a, a status, if you like, in, in the Middle East around Iraq. It was the start of the Iraq war and the whole Saddam Hussein story. Um, and the army recruiter said to me, you know, he looked at my certificates and my projected A level of GCSE results. And he said, why do you want to come in the RAF? And I said, well, I'm really interested in, in serving my country. And a little bit like Alan, I, I suppose it was, I didn't really know what to do. And I wanted to go somewhere where I could belong and enjoy being around people. Um, and the guy said to me, yeah, you're, you're a bright lad. <clears throat> he looked at my results. and was like, um, my projected results. And I was like, okay, he said, at the minute, we, we're not taking anyone on in the RAF um, unless you, you, you want to join the army. And I was like, well, I, don't, I don't think I do want to join the army. For some reason, I had it in my head that I wanted to join the RAF. And he said, uh, you know what? He said, the best thing you can do, young man, is go to college, do your two years at college, get your A-levels and come back afterwards. He said, because you're a bright lad, and that means that you can start higher up in the RAF. And I was a bit dejected, and I walked out. Um, and I remember going home and my mum was absolutely delighted that the RAF had told me to go away, to be honest, because <laughs> that's the last thing she wanted me to do. But it, it was a very similar feeling to what Alan had. I wanted to belong. I wasn't sure what to do. Um, and then I was told, well, actually, why don't you just go and do something with the results that you've got and to go to college? And obviously that led to everything else that has now happened. And the fact that I went to college and I went to university, I was only the second person in my family, really the second person I knew after my sister that had ever gone. And I think that comes down to exactly what you just talked about, that idea of, and I'm going to link it back to the evolutionary side of things, of being in a tribe and knowing that you're vulnerable and knowing that other people have got your back and that you can go out on a limb and try things and fail. And there are still people there that will welcome you and that will look after you when you're feeling vulnerable. 
Yeah. And just, yeah. just to add, you know, I think it's, it's amazing hearing both of your stories and, and one of the things, you know, modern times is um, times are changing and people are speaking their truth more because more people are doing it. So the, the people who are trying to figure out the past and make sense of it. And as you said, the acronym, uh, Alan, uh, for everything, a reason is so important. Right. And I came across a quote that I'll, I'll share that really emphasizes this. And it's from Brene Brown, who has done so much amazing work around living with courage and shame, resiliency and all of this. But her quote is, you either walk inside of your story and own it or stand outside of your story and hustle for your worthiness. How true it is. So, you know, I just want to commend you both uh, from a really honest place to like, continue to speak your truth and share your story and share your experiences on your podcast, because you're going to give permission for other people to, to know it's okay to explore the past, all the shit, you know, and, <laughs> and explore it and try to understand what you've learned from it. Um, so I just wanted to, to drop that in. That's, thank you, Andy. I mean, it's took a long time, Andy. I couldn't have done this maybe 10 years ago. Definitely not. I think it's been a it's it's been a journey of vulnerability and and like you say I think as you get older and there's trust around people and you, your willingness to share it does it does help you as a person then and, and helps with your self awareness and I think about relating it back to social capital when you think you've got zero social capital it has a significant impact on on imposter syndrome and then obviously linking that with professional capital as well and. I, I, I trace it back to I, I've been very happy in middle management roles for many, many years as a, as a fairly competent head of PE, securing my knowledge, good at putting a curriculum together. But I never felt I was capable of taking that, that next step, which in hindsight, I, I clearly was. And, and it, it, ta- it took lockdown and, and it took conversations and working with Lewis and a great team in Manila to, to actually raise about either step up or shut up. And, and Ian Salis talked about that in a, on a podcast recently. It's no good being in the periphery and saying, oh, this could be done better, that could be done. You've got to actually go and, go and do it, go and live it. But mm-hmm. you, to do that, you need to be surrounded by people who, who believe in you and, and value you. And, and that transformation, it can happen at any point in your life. And it just seems to have happened really to me in my early 40s uh, rather than sort of younger on because I've accepted that habitus that Bordeaux talks about and and the acronym now for fear that I'd like to just put forward to you guys is instead of them negative ones I've now transformed that to feeling excited and ready Mm, Nice. and the imposter syndrome is still there don't get me wrong I don't think that will ever go but in some ways I think it's healthy because it helps me to be better yeah. And I'm using that. I don't call it, I don't think it's a negative thing now. I think it, you know what, imposter syndrome means that I'm, ah, yeah, I, I want to do that reading. I want to get better. I want to get up there. I want to do that presentation. It's the confidence to acknowledge that fear, but to face it and realize that, you know what, you're all right. You're doing well. You've got the skills. And mm-hmm. that, but that takes, that took me a long time. And I'm not afraid to admit that. That took me a lot longer than probably it should have done, but my past determined that. And I acknowledge that. Yeah, just to add one quick thing, um, Lewis, before you share, is um, it ties in with the work of Dr. Martin Seligman from Positive Psychology, where he says, you know, uh, when we are feeling these things and when we lack confidence or we have anxiety or we're struggling, he calls it scanning for the good. So there are strategies that you can absolutely apply to look at past successes. We're always looking at what's not working in our life. And, and Dr. Martin Seligman devoted his, uh, the second half of his career, he was a clinical psychologist who for years just looked at why people were screwed up. And that's what the medical profession did. And he was like, I'm tired of this. This makes me want to like stick a fork in my eye. I would, I would rather look at what's working in people and have people uh, draw attention to their strengths, their natural gifts. So he calls it being a researcher of good. 
being a researcher of good and scanning for the gold, scanning for the, for the good as evidence of past success. So when we are in situations where we might be experiencing imposter syndrome, and I agree, it, it'll probably never go away, but we can greatly decrease uh, the amount of time it happens by putting these strategies into practice. So when that happens, you begin to scan for the, for the good and the evidence to say, I've done it before. I, I have these skills that have gotten me through. There's no question in my mind. I can do it again. And then that kind of creates more rather than constriction in the mind, it creates more expansion and, and possibility, which frees you up in thinking. So Lewis, uh, you were going to say something before, but I just wanted to drop that in. Yeah, thanks, Andy. I think that's wonderful. And um, I've got probably a few points to make, which, which link back to that, this idea of fear and anxiety are, thing, are something that isn't permanent. Um, you know, we know from Buddhist practices, nothing is permanent. And the quicker we can accept that and move on, the better. But in terms of permanence, we know fear and anxiety are often fleeting. Um, and there's, there's a sort of tactic I'd like to come back to a little bit later that of a, of a way of a, a sort of a cognitive process that I think is really useful. That's a hybrid of, of some work Tony Robbins does, the very influential, um, larger than life motivator. Uh, and also uh, it touches on a little bit of something Ant Middleton shares in one of his books about, it's called The Fear Bubble, which is a very easy read and, and, and loads of fun if you're interested. But I want to I want to come back to that in just a moment after sort of calling you out, Alan, a little bit. Um, and, I, and I do this with the greatest respect. You said you wouldn't have been able to do that 10 years ago in terms of the awareness of imposter syndrome. Um, I, I don't think, and I, and I speak on my behalf and, and, and possibly on yours here, that we could have done what we're doing now two years ago. Maybe. Um, yeah. I, I think in those first conversations that we had around us in a podcast, there was lots of reasons why we shouldn't do it. There were lots of reasons why it should be something that actually let's just leave it as an idea. Yeah, of course we could do this. Yeah, they, you know, we'll come back to it next week. And I think as COVID um, became something that, that stalled our lives more than we thought, and because that pandemic lasted a bit longer, it sort of created that fear of, oh, we haven't really got an excuse now. We need we need to sort of get on with this, <laughs> didn't it? Um, yeah. You know. And, 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 and we did, and we got on with it, and we were full of self-doubt and full of different thoughts that, who's, who's going to listen to us? Um, and I often, th I often think that on a weekly basis still now. But, um, you know, th th this thought of actually coming on to a, a conversation with successful professionals, and, and it's an absolute delight to, to, to be talking to you, Andy, from, from the work that you've done and, and how very much um, we align with a lot of our thinking so far in this discussion is to accept that these sort of discussions are something that, that people have. And like Andy said, to, to put it out there as something to normalize, you know, to, to talk about things in this sort of manner, especially, um, especially as people in a profession where there, there is a hell of a lot of fear and anxiety sometimes in teaching. There's a lot of people that feel judged. There's a lot of people that feel like they're in a position where decisions are being made about them and for them, but they don't have any, sort of control over um and i suppose that control side of it is a nice bridge to talk about the uh the sort of cognitive process that i found works and it's by no means linear um and it, and it isn't something that i feel maybe would work for everybody but already andy's mentioned about the positives focusing on the positives we know like andy said from seligman the, and all the positive psychology work the science of well-being course on coursera which is brilliant by the way if you haven't done that have a little look at that um gratitude's a huge huge um tactic to, to help us frame things a little bit more positively something as simple as writing down three positive things from the day can really change our mood so one of, one of the, the tactics I have is something as simple as that. I don't always necessarily write it down. But I'll think about it or I'll talk about it, whether that's to my wife or if she won't listen to one of the dogs, you know. <laughs> um, and then there's also that controllable element. What is controllable and what isn't controllable? And that's where anxiety breeds for me. Um, where, where something's out of your control, anxiety is at its worst and its strongest and it manifests itself in, in such a deep-rooted way 
that is literally a waste of emotion um, because it isn't something that you can have a handle on. So trying to just identify that and being aware of that and almost, you know, with practice, beginning to be at peace with that is a really strong, strong um, step that, that I, I try and take. Um, and then trying to identify, and Andy mentioned this one earlier as well, is the, is the issue that's causing the anxiety or if it is in an, the actual fear, is it in the past, is it in the present, or is it in the future? And we all know the answer to that 90% of the time, because that's how anxiety works, is that that's in the future. You know, we, we're worried about things that haven't happened yet. Um, and we touched upon earlier that idea of anxiety being bred by past events as well. When we have time to reflect, like in COVID, and like when you're stuck in the house all day, every day, you know, there's that opportunity to dwell on the past or to think about the future. And again, linking it to the pandemic, I think one of the things we all found really difficult, I so can't speak for everyone, of course, but what I found really difficult was there was no punctuation point or end point to what we were doing. So there was a lockdown and it wasn't, oh, but in June, everything will be all right, don't worry. It wasn't in July or August, everything will be all right. It was, this is for an undetermined amount of time and we're not sure when it will end, which drives that anxiety of not being able to control something in the future. So what can you do? Well, bring it back to the present and be grateful and positive for the things that you do have, your own personal health, the health of the people you love, somewhere to be um, safe in your own house. So having that idea of past, present or future always helps me. And then I think the last one that I work through um, is the question of, do you need to deal with this now? Do you actually need to action anything to deal with this now? And if the answer to that is no, it's again, putting that in a category of then, well, if you don't, then that's something in the future. If that's something in the future, do you need to be spending time working on it now? The answer to that is usually no. Is it in your control? Again, because of how anxiety manifests itself, often the answer to that is no. So you, you start to get some concrete answers to some really cloudy, worried thoughts, which then can just bring that down. It doesn't make it disappear, it certainly doesn't for me, but it helps me to start to manage expectations and emotions and it brings that awareness in so that you can break that habitus that you talked about, Alan, and you can think, well, just because I'm responding in this way or just because I'm from a certain place or I act in a certain way doesn't mean that this is bound to happen. There's a way of breaking that cycle. Wow. Um, so there's, a lot, there's a lot of stuff there, Lewis. <laughs> amazing stuff. Absolutely amazing stuff. Can I, can I bring it back round? to the Darwinistic approach to this then. So is it meant to be that it's survival of the fittest where if you're actually physically weak or you're perceiving that you're physically weak, you are then going to be dominated by other humans or you're meant to be dominated by other humans or other species that then causes your anxiety. So it comes back to that question there about Zebras, and I love that question. Why yes. don't zebras get ulcers, by the way? Well, I'll tell you what, read the book. It's about 700 pages long. It's a, it's a wonderful <laughs> book. So Robert Sapolsky's whole theory is that the only thing we need to be frightened or stressed about is being eaten or being killed or both. And actually, everything else doesn't matter too much. But stomach ulcers are a, a sort of number one sign of high levels of stress and of being in anxiety for lots of time. So his point that he's trying to make um, throughout his book is that zebras don't get ulcers because they don't worry too much about it. They deal with fear when fear strikes. They don't find themselves in anxious states for a long time because they work as a tribe. They have different things that help them. Obviously, the colour of their, <laughs> excuse me, their fur causes confusion for a predator as they approach them because they can't see where one zebra ends and another one starts. The fact that zebras will always sort of graze with one person keeping a lookout, they'll always graze in a sort of circular sort of area to keep an eye out for what's happening when one responds the other will respond in the same way <clears throat> now they live in constant fear of being eaten humans don't but humans get stomach ulcers and zebras don't so the book starts to break down what those different issues and those different areas of of real reasons for that happening are um, and as much as there might not be one simple answer for me going back to what you said alan i don't think it's necessarily that if you are weak then you live in fear and anxiety. I think we can be more specific than that. And I think that it's a little bit more related to, to movement, if you can move well. 
um, and my own personal journey through a, a, a platform or a, a way of working called functional patterns has, has sort of given me enough personal, real, solid evidence of your biomechanics improving, having a direct impact on the levels of anxiety that you actually hold. Um, we had Daryl Nickel on our podcast last year, and I work quite closely with Daryl online. He's a functional patterns practitioner. And essentially, functional patterns is, a, is an approach to fitness that values humans' first principles. So the whole approach is wound around standing, walking, running, and throwing and respecting the gait cycle and the movements that allow that to happen. And there's multiple ways you can access functional patterns. And it is, it's changed, it, it sounds cliche, and it might sound a little bit over the top, but it's literally changed my life in terms of pain management, in terms of the way I move, in terms of managing my anxiety. And not because of the sort of old adage of, well, do exercise and it makes you feel good. Yes? But there's a hierarchy to that exercise. You wouldn't drive a car with flat tires up and down the country. If you can't actually move well, exercise can often be the worst thing you could possibly do. And all it can do is compound the issues that you've got. So coming back to what you said, Alan, I think from an evolutionary point of view, it's more to do with if you can move well, you know when it comes to fight or flight or freeze, as, as, as we know is in there as well, actually the fight or the flight become options. And they become very real options and you can do both. And I think that's hardwired in us somewhere. And I think if we can start to understand that better as to why our biomechanics are so, so deeply linked to fight or flight, that actually as a human species, the whole idea and the whole reality of anxiety starts to melt and become much less powerful because we're focusing on the right things. That's, I'm just trying to process that there with a oh. link in freeze with apathy then and with not wanting to get better and just settling for being inside your comfort zone so evolutionary you won't fight or fly you just freeze and that then leads to maybe that anxiety state or that imposter syndrome where you don't think you're good enough does that make sense does, does that, am i going down the right line there is that yeah. How does that resonate with you, Andy? Yeah, I think when when you think of the freeze thing, it's just like you're a victim of your circumstances. You know, nothing I can do matters. You know, so yeah. why even try? So you get caught up in the the habitual routines of life from a victim mentality. The learned right? helplessness sort of idea of the elephant tied to the small post. You've seen the photos before. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Is it, um, it, for, for me, again, picking on something you mentioned there, Alan, is I'd also argue that you might be talking about the freeze, not just being the apathy or the comfort zone or the learned helplessness, but also the freeze knowing that it's you don't have the confidence or you don't have the ability of, of real helplessness, of actually being, I'm not in a position where I can do anything about this. Um, and that's real for some people as well. Yeah, they're, they're paralyzed by it. Yeah. Right? Because they don't. So you're talking about moving being a part of this journey. I, my dog barks on my podcast sometimes too. So that's okay. Just let the dog bark. Hey, we're real. Long. We're real. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll let him bark himself out or just keep going. Okay. So what I was going to say is I completely agree with you, uh, Lewis, on the movement piece, because movement has made a massive difference in my life. And that's what I shared in my TED talk was I shared giving that TED talk. You talk about fear. Holy shit. I was getting on the stage to talk about my past and I had never spoken about it publicly. So I wanted to talk about, you know, what it was like growing up in dysfunction in a dysfunctional family environment and plagued by mental health and addiction. And I have a brother who committed suicide. I have another brother who died of drug addiction and trying to make sense of all of it. And the thing I kept returning back to was sport and physical activity. So despite the fear of growing up in those circumstances, I gravitated towards movement and sport, ultimately American football and golf. 
And that saved my life. There's no question it saved my life because it gave me opportunities that my brothers didn't have. My brothers were very gifted musicians and, and very talented, but they didn't have movement, you know? So it was about a week before I was giving the TED talk and, and I was going for a run and I was kind of going through the talk in my head and fear struck me. And I was like, there's no friggin' way I'm going to get up on the stage next week and do this talk. I'll just talk about something that's really comfortable. I'll talk about the need for movement and we got to keep kids moving. And I've given the talk, you know, keynote speeches and workshops. So it's easy. And then by the time I got back home, I said, no, you need to follow through on that talk. This is what you're meant to do. So I guess I go back to this idea of movement being the, the medicine to kind of get over uh, some of the, the difficulties in life. But I think it's about thinking well, too. It's about moving well and, and being, as you say, biomechanically sound in our movements leads to having more confidence and, and being able to move in multiple contexts. But I think we can also be paralyzed by not thinking well. So it's developing the skills of thinking well in addition to that. And when we can bring that element in as well, then it's you're creating more of a whole person. Tell us a bit more about that thinking well, Andy. You've talked about the moving well and you become paralyzed. You've, you've had some significant trauma there and, and thank you for sharing that. And I must admit, I've watched your TED talk and I, I was in tears and I was really inspired by it to, to get out of my comfort zone and start doing the podcast and start moving myself up the leadership ladder. How can we help people by thinking well who are still struggling with this imposter syndrome, this, they're struggling with their confidence levels? Um, you know, a lot of the work suggests going back to what you use habitus, it's, it's personal narrative. And it's being very aware of the inner voice that's within us. And how that inner voice was shaped, you know, historians of self shaped by past experiences. And being a victim of our circumstances does not help us build an empowering personal narrative. The work of Dr. Jim Lair, who's a, a world-renowned performance psychologist who's worked with 17 world number ones, a lot of them in tennis, but he's worked with a lot of other athletes, Olympians. The work that he does is, yeah, I'll read a quote to you, and then I'll ask you how it resonates with you with your question, Alan. But the power broker in your life is the voice that no one hears. How well you revisit the tone and content of your private voice is what determines the quality of your life. It is the master storyteller and the, story, uh, and the stories we tell ourselves become our reality. So when it comes to thinking well, it's, it's thinking about the way that we're speaking to ourselves, drawing self-awareness to that inner voice and, and to know that building an empowering personal narrative is a trainable skill. We're not just born with some shitty internal voice, personal, personal narrative, like we can build the internal skills necessary to flip from a disempowering personal narrative to an empowering personal narrative by applying all of the strategies that we've talked about and, and all of the strategies out there that have still yet to be researched and explored. So when it comes to thinking, well, it begin, begins with the internal voice. And it begins, um, it begins with really unpacking the internal voice and then beginning to know that it's a trainable skill. And what Michael Gervais, the performance psychologist says is that confidence comes from not what we do. Confidence comes from what we say to ourselves. Right. And it's not just yeah. making something up. It's not saying that, you know, um, I can, I can run under a four minute mile when I'm not even close. That's, the, that's not what it's about. It's not telling ourselves false things. It's, it's um, grounding ourselves in, in reality and, and speaking our truth and, and learning to, um, to develop an empowering personal narrative to support us on our journeys. So that to me is thinking well. So it's breaking it down and knowing that it's a trainable skill. I like the, the quote that that idea of essentially you're your own, the, there's a roommate that lives inside your own head and that roommate can be incredibly positive or that roommate can prevent you from experiencing things. And you talked there, I, I'm not 
kind of quite get the wording right, but you talked about the the, the voice in your head giving the, you the confidence. And if it gives you that confidence to experience something new, then those experiences allow you to draw on those, which leads to the next opportunity for you to have that discourse or that debate in your head that then leads to a, well, I'll give it a go and you'll have that experience. And then the growth almost starts to be step by step. Would that be too simple in, in the terms of what you're saying? No, not at all. But it, it is also rooted at absolutely. That's a part of it, but it's rooted in doing the hard work. You got to do the hard work. You can't have a confident inner voice. If you're not doing the work, you can read everything out there about having confidence. You can read everything out there about building an empowering narrative. But Alan, you said it before, if you're not going to give it a go and you're not going to do the work, then it's just false you know, you will not develop a confident inner voice. So in addition to what you're saying, Lewis, is you've got to do the deep internal work to build the skills necessary to speak uh, with, you know, with a more internal confidence, you know, and to build that uh, internal confidence, you have to do the internal work. I, I, I'm going to bring that back, Andy, to, to what you were talking about. Is that manifestation? If you can, if you can manifest positive thoughts so in your dreams in your writing in the way that you you act and your values will that then come to fruition and i give you an example this week i was reading about this and it was one of our podcast guests steve sallis put it onto his linkedin erling harlan has just signed for manchester city yeah 51 million or something like that crazy amount of money but he's um he had a, a piece out saying that he's careers teacher had asked him what you're going to what do you want to do when you're older and he, he was on a tour with um he was on a tour with his youth team and he was supposed to do his homework and he goes i'm not doing my homework i'm going to be a professional footballer and I'm was he manifested he <laughs> was i mean i'm sure we've <laughs> i'm sure millions have said that and they've never made it but he truly 100 percent believed it and manifested that and it came to fruition and he's obviously at the top of his game uh playing for man city going to be playing for his country is that important is that manifestation super important because you think the other way when you're thinking negative it tends to happen doesn't it if you can't do something if you believe you can't do something you won't mm -hmm. whereas flip it the other way so how does manifestation fit into there andy yeah i that's an interesting story with that contract and i mean one in a million right uh, but having that core belief, like there are people that, that, that have a belief from the time they're young, unwavering belief that this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. So good for them. I would argue that he had a lot of support along the way. <laughs> he had a lot of nurturing. He, you know, he had everything he needed to maybe, I don't know his story, but I'm assuming that he had a lot of support on the way that allowed him to continue to manifest and, and dream big. But yeah. for the majority of us, I think what it comes down to is living in alignment with our core values, you know, and when we're out of alignment with our core values, you know, we cannot align our thoughts, our actions, our words, right? There's a disconnect. So to me, the manifestation piece is possible when we stay aligned to our core values. And a lot of people, you know, you can say what's important to you. And a lot of people will bounce around. <clears throat> I, I coach one person who has he created a personal manifesto list 15 years ago, which is awesome. There's 11 statements on there and there's so much text and there's so many values there. I challenged him to narrow it down to the top three or five values that are most important and it's difficult for people. So most people can't name their core values. So I think that's part of it, that if you're going to manifest what's possible, you have to be aligned. And to be aligned, you've got to do the deep work to identify your core values. And we, when we return back to the concept of fear, you're always in a better position to deal with fear in your life when we're living in alignment with our core values, you know, rather than being misaligned, complacent. I think I, I believe in that. I'm, I don't believe in that. There should be no question, do the deep work to live with clarity and intention. So I think that's part of it, Alan, is, and that's a huge part of it, is manifestation comes from living a, an aligned life. Yeah, but that authenticity is yeah. something that 
is come through, shining through in our podcast, hasn't it, Lewis? Being an authentic leader, so important. Yeah, it has, and you um, and me touched on one area there, early Parliament. His father was a footballer, and we know that through evolution, there are certain things passed on genetically, certainly not just by one generation, but to bring this back to fear, we know that evolutionary-wise, we, we've got fears that are inherent within us of darkness, heights. You'd probably argue social rejection. We have quite right fears of some animals and we have a fear of harm and a fear of death as a human being. That, they're, they're sort of part of our makeup and our DNA. But there's also evidence, isn't there, that we can pass on our fears and anxieties through our genetics. And I just wonder if that's an example there of the opposite happening, of the belief being, and that, that glass ceiling being broken by his father in this case, mm-hmm. and then him knowing that that gives him, uh, you, would, you would imagine, a distinct advantage. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't work in professional football, but I'd certainly imagine so. Um, yeah. And then as a result of that, that has allowed him to have more belief. If that was to happen over a series of different generations, would that be then part of their genetic makeup? That they become a little bit braver and they become a little bit more positive and they have a little bit less fear and anxiety. Yeah. Well, you see sporting dynasties, don't you? The the Maldinis in, in Italy, how it's passed down from the father played, the, there was Paolo, and then there's the, the younger one now that's playing in, in AC Milan and he, you see, almost see a very similar characteristic in the way they play and their the values that, that shine out from them, that they're they're honest, they're they're hardworking, they're not like unbelievably technical, but they know what they're about. They've got a strong belief in themselves. So you're right, I think there's something in that, Louis, how it's it could be passed down and comes back to the zebras again, isn't it? The strongest zebras who breed, they survive, don't they? And it also, um, yeah, yeah, it comes back to what you were talking about as well, about your habitus and where you brought up. If you're brought up, there the dogs again. You're brought up around anxiety and you're brought up around a constant need to be on the lookout for danger because you feel vulnerable, then then that's going to still sit with you for a long time after, isn't it? That's uh, rooted in Dr. Dabar Mate's work, who I already mentioned. And, you know, his quote, again, the attempt to escape pain is what creates more of it. So he gets people to sit with it and understand uh, intergenerational trauma, how trauma is passed down. There's no question. So, Alan, yeah, the the greatness is passed down, you know, through modeling, through all of these things. I think that really is passed down over over generations. But also, when you look at the, the negative side of it, intergenerational trauma, trauma is definitely passed down unless you break the cycle as a parent. So, no I, I, I've, just been reading, yeah, I've, just, I've just been reading Edith Eager. I don't know if you've encountered her. Edith was an Auschwitz survivor and she's wrote a couple of unbelievable books. Uh, the Choice is one of them about her story of how she actually survived. and. It was through hope, not fear, that the vast majority of Auschwitz survivors actually got through that ordeal. And they changed the narrative of, I know she did anyway, she thought, she pretended that the guards were the captives and she was free because the only thing they couldn't take from her was a mind. Mm. And as the prisoners that died, their mind went, I can't do it, I'm just, they just rolled over and, if they felt they were helpless and it was, it was gone or they'd, she'd give examples where they'd just go and throw themselves against the electric wire or she made a vow to herself and she had pictures in her mind of her boyfriend, of her family, and it was, you can't take my mind. Once you take my mind, I'm broken. And I think that's a lot what we've talked about today is about that internal thought press of fear, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It is, um, and it probably brings us round to where we started. and. Um, Andy, I want to pass back over to you to, to tell us where else you've explored maybe with fear um, that you feel might be useful within this conversation right at the beginning. Alan touched on that. Um, that right. fact that this started, this whole conversation started as a result of you writing that piece around fear. And that's what raised this subject and got us together now. Um, what else would you like to explore? 
Well, I think that we covered so much today. We had a structure for the podcast that we were going to go through. And then I'm glad that we just let it evolve organically because I think we touched upon all of the different um, things that we wanted to mention. So I can just reinforce, you know, I wanted to, to share, you know, that, that idea of real versus perceived. And we started the podcast with uh, Jules quote that fear is a thief, uh, amazing podcast. She is incredible. She's an incredible human, what she went through and, and what she learned about herself and how she ultimately gave back to the world through her music. But that quote kind of sums up our podcast today. Fear is a thief and don't let it, you know, it's not about not letting it appear in your life, but learn that, you know, you talk about internal locus of control and external locus of, of control, which is what you mentioned, uh, Lewis, this idea of knowing what is within our control and knowing what is not is the first step. But Jim Carrey uh, gave a, a great commencement speech uh, in 2014. And what he talked about was uh, he grew up uh, in, a, in poverty and he dreamed of making it big and he he visualized and he wrote himself a check for a million dollars when he was a kid. And it's an amazing story about manifestation, but he used comedy to free people from concern. So that was his tool to free people from concern and in a way free people from his own concern about his father being bankrupt and losing his job and, and having this pressure to make it big so that he could support his family. But throughout his career, he, he just skyrocketed to fame. And then he had this overwhelming anxiety and these overwhelming demons in his life. And what he did was he started to meditate and, and he started to really employ mindfulness. And what he said to the graduates in the commencement speech is mindfulness and meditation has allowed me to see the difference between an actual dog that's going to eat you and a dog in our mind that is going to eat us. And there's a big difference. And what he says is many people go through their life not knowing the difference and they live in fight or flight or freeze mode. So meditation, mindfulness, all the tools that we're talking about are so important in getting us to understand the difference. And that goes full circle back to the beginning of the, the podcast where we talked about why we were doing this. It's to unpack fear and to know that, that we have it within us, the inner capacity to deal with it straight on. And, and as Gabor Mate says, rather than escape from fear, uh, you know, and creating more of it, heading straight forward and, and uh, tackling it and grappling with it and understanding its role in our life and not being a victim to it and acknowledge it. So that's kind of what I wanted to, to share. Outstanding. Yeah. I'm conscious we haven't talked a lot about meditation and, and mindfulness, but it is something that's important that has been touched upon a couple of times along with that sort of idea of awareness. And it's interesting what you say in the, the Jim Carrey example of the dog that's real that is going to bite you or the dog that you perceive in your mind, which sort of brings us back to that that link that we have and that close relationship between anxiety and fear. And I found a research paper by Steve Steiner, Steiner in 2002. It's a literature review around fear. And he uses the phrase that from the research that he's um, studied, that it, the emotional and cognitive processes cannot actually be disassociated with regards to anxiety and fear. The response feels real. Your brain thinks it's in fear when it's not in fear, when it's actually in anxiety. And that really highlights that importance, doesn't it, of that awareness of emotions and of, of that ability to be mindful and to take a moment and to recognize what's real and what's not. Yeah, and just to add one quick thing to that is um, the brain doesn't sometimes know the difference between anxiety and excitement because it's processed in the same way. So especially in sports psychology. So my son and I were playing golf the other day and he's, he's getting pretty good. Like he's, he wants to get a scholarship. He started playing three years ago. He's down to about a, a five or a six handicap right now. And um, he still gets a bit nervous when people are watching him tee off. So we were playing nine holes together and, you know, he, now we play, we play uh, 
we match up evenly. I don't have to give him any advantages like I did when he started the game. So we're playing this match and then we catch up to the group in front of us and it's a foursome and two of them are pros at our chorus and the other two are pretty accomplished golfers. And then we have to tee off in front of them because they let us go through. And he kind of pulled his shot a little bit. It wasn't a great shot. And we got in the cart and he was like, man, that's, that was kind of scary, like hitting in front of people. I said, were you actually afraid or were you excited? And he was like, actually, I was pretty excited. I wanted to hit a good shot. I said, no, the difference, son, know the difference between excitement and anxiety and know that it's, it's this, it's the brain interprets it the same way. So when we move into certain situations, if you have to give a talk on, on the stage, you might feel anxious, but it's actually to what uh, extent is it excitement to share your message and the work you've done, you've worked so hard on, you have an opportunity to share. So it's really important moving forward to, to pick apart and double click on anxiety sometimes and play around with it and say, is this really anxiety or worry? Or is it actually excitement? So or a more work on, on awareness of what the emotion is. I like that idea. Double yeah. click on and there's a drop down menu under anxiety of what you think might be yeah. anxiety. <laughs> might actually be yeah. a dozen other things. But it's all awareness, isn't it? It's being aware of the emotions yeah. that you're feeling and, and what's happening. And as soon as you're aware of that, there's an element of control, isn't there? And then there's an opportunity yeah. to react and respond in a in an appropriate way. Alan, I'll come to you for any any closing thoughts before we finish. Oh, it's been it's been an absolutely unbelievable chat. Thought we've been over an hour now, and it's just flown by. And that's an indication of how much we've all enjoyed it. And it was in flow state. And when it's in flow state, as we know, things just keep firing out. And I'd just like to thank Andy for joining us. Thank thanks to Lewis. Yeah, sure. And I can't wait to listen back to this. So many takeaways. Brilliant. Well, thanks to, to you, Alan, and to Andrew, uh, to Andy for, for joining us. Um, Andy, be, before we do go, would you like to share a little bit of information about your podcast, Run Your Life? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I My website is runyourlifepodcast.com, uh, and uh, I I have another platform that I share the, the episodes on. Uh, I can share in the show notes. Um, I think I just did my 205th episode, so... It's a work in progress. I love it. Um, you know, it, it moves me so much when I sit with these amazing people and have these conversations and uh, the learning, as you both know, as podcast hosts is ever present when you're doing these podcasts. So um, yeah, you can find it online and um, you can find it in the show notes. And also um, I will add your podcast to the show notes and highly encourage leaders and people to uh, follow your work you know there's so many valuable resources that you share and you know it's great and we should do a part two at some point um pick apart another theme you know uh, every every once in a while come together the three of us to have these discussions great idea. And, fantastic idea I'd, uh, I'd jump at the chance of that and it's been an absolute pleasure having you on guys listen to run your life podcast and you can hear from andy if you're new to it you've got did you say 200 and 200 plus episodes to catch up on yeah 205 yeah <laughs> they'll keep you busy for a while um, Andy I, I can't wait to have you back on to chat about a topic I, I've, I've really enjoyed today thanks for your insights and see you later